This is Mark Guerrero. Welcome to East LA Music Stories, episode 24. My guest is Joe Espinosa. Uh, in the 60s, he was in uh, Marcy and the Imperials, uh, the Village Callers, and then uh, eventually he was in uh, Chico, and we're going to talk about all that. Uh, his band, the Village Callers, are very important in East LA rock history. Uh, they were arguably the first band to uh, use Latin percussion, and um, they had a record called Hector that made a lot of noise. It wound up in a major movie. Welcome, Joe. How you doing? Oh, pretty good, Mark. Thank you for having me on board. Yeah, man, looking good. And I see yeah. to your right a cardboard cutout of you when you were really young. Yes. What band were you in at that time? Um, I was with Marcy and the Imperials. I believe that was back in 63, 64. And uh, we used to dress up with these short coats and the little bow ties oh, and yeah. stuff, gigs back, in, back then. Kind of cool how like all of us East LA bands back in the early to mid 60s, we, we dressed pretty cool, you know, coats, ties, uh, uniforms, yeah. we're pretty sharp. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. Before uh, it became in fashion to not use uniforms obviously, <laughs> in the mid 60s or so. Anyway, um, so um, how did you get interested in music? How did you become a musician? Well, I uh, hooked up with Marcy back in junior high school. What was his yeah. last name? Uh, Marcelino Alvarado. Okay. Uh, and uh, Marcy was self taught. He would stay home, practice, learn songs. And so I started hanging out with them and, and, and I wanted to get involved with music, but I didn't have a guitar. So one day I was walking down the street because uh, we lived in City Terrace and I was walking up Mariana Avenue over to Marcy's and uh, there was, it was happened to be trash day and uh, there was an old beat up guitar in there in the trash. So I picked it up, took it down Marcy's and he says, you know, I think, I think we could fix this. Maybe you can play this. I said, great. So he did fix it for me, got some strings on it. It wasn't quite in tune, but it was close. And so I started playing a guitar back then uh, with him. Now I remember Marcy and the Imperials. I saw Marcy and the Imperials, and you must have been in it, but I didn't know you then. We're talking like 64. Yes. And uh, did you guys play at the Cleveland House? Yes, yes, at the clean okay. That's where I saw you guys. I used to yeah. play there with my band, Mark and the Escorts. Uh, the Exotics used to play there. Yeah. And I saw you guys there. And there were Battle of the Bands there. And yeah. I know we were in a couple. We were in three of them with the Exotics. I don't remember if you guys were on them, too. But you probably did some Battle of the Bands there, too. Oh, oh yeah, we did there. Yeah, there and also at City Terrace Park. Now, who are some of the guys in Marcy and the Imperials? Uh, we had uh, Adolfo Martinez, and uh, he ended up joining the Village Callers and with Chico. Known also, as Fuzzy, right? Yeah, known as Fuzzy. And uh, Richard Sanchez, uh, Fuzzy's brother-in-law, he played uh, played saxophone. And then we had the great Kenny Roman, who, oh. who uh, played with, uh, with Tierra and El Chicano, just about everybody later in life there. Let's say something and, about Kenny. Uh yeah, I remember Kenny. He was the original drummer of Tierra back in 72. And that guy was a ferocious drummer. Oh, and he must have been a little kid when you had him, right? Yeah, he was about 12, 13. Yeah. Well, I, I always call him the uh, the Keith Moon of East L.A. Because <laughs> he had so so much energy, you know. And oh, monster. Like, and, his, like, and his dad was a great drummer also. I heard. Yeah, uh, Henry. And uh, Henry was... Uh, uh, work in nightclubs and uh, he taught Kenny and he was always with us. He, he always took the band around. A very, very nice man. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Henry yeah. Roman. Yeah. Kenny played and, uh, on that first theater album and he was amazing. As a matter of fact, I have a photo of Marcy and the Imperials right here. All righty. With, with uh, Kenny Roman. And, okay. Get a little more center. Yeah. That, that's good. Oh, look, how little, look how little he was. Oh, yeah. Kenny was a little guy, but. He had such talent and such powerful hands and feet. I mean, the guy, a guy could really carry a good beat. Yeah. yeah now, so. now, a funny thing happened is uh, when you guys had some band cards made up, Marcy and the Imperials, there was a misprint, and it said, <laughs> Marcy and them Imperials. 
and they took <laughs> the M and they threw it at the end of the word the. And you guys, yeah. that doesn't sound bad. And didn't you use that for a while? Yes, yes, we ended up <laughs> using that for a while. Them Imperials. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty funny. <laughs> That was crazy. Now, I heard that Marcy went on to go back to school. He got some kind of a degree. And what did he do? Yeah, Marcy uh, uh, started going to East L.A. College, got involved with the Chicano studies. And uh, while he was there, he he met one of the counselors and helped him go to UCLA. So he picked up a bachelor's and then picked up a master's degree and then uh, came back and taught at East L.A. College for a few years. Very nice. Yeah. Yeah, he did very well, and uh, uh, as well as Fuzzy, Fuzzy, Fuzzy traveled around with with the uh, with with his group after he left the Village Callers. Then uh, he went to college, and and uh, he got a music degree, got a master's, uh, taught at uh, uh, Belvedere Junior High, and then also taught at Roosevelt. And he was the first instructor to uh, start up the mariachi programs at. Uh, at the uh, high school level and also junior high school level. So very impressive. Very cool. I love those stories. A lot of work. Yes. So uh, tell me what what were the highlights with playing with that band? Uh, Any particular gigs you remember? Marcy and the Imperials back then, we were just starting off. Um, uh, We did some uh, church festivals. You know, we opened up for uh, some of the other groups. Uh, we opened for the Midnighters a couple times at uh, St. Alfonso's, and uh, that was that was always good. Marcy loved to do James Brown and the old R&B music. He was very good at doing that, had, had a great feel for it. And uh, back then, it was just bass, guitar, drums, and two horns. And what were some of the venues you played in the circuit? Uh- Oh, well, the circuit with uh, Marcy, mainly uh, St. Alfonso's, the CYO Hall, you know, kind of around the little East L.A. area there. Uh, we used to do house parties mm-hmm. and uh, we play for beer back then until we got a little better. And then we started doing the uh, St. Alfonso's and CYO's. And of course, weddings and presentations. And- oh, yeah, weddings. <laughs> a lot of house parties. Yeah, people would hire us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So how did the Village Callers evolve? Well, what... Uh, what happened, I left Marcy and the Imperials and I joined a band in Pico Rivera called the Highlighters. And um, uh, Johnny Gonzalez was the uh, keyboardist there for that band. So I joined their, their group and, uh, and then the group kind of broke up after about a year, year and a half. And then uh, Johnny and I joined the Summits and we had Sammy Lee in the Summits and he recorded Hey Joe you know, in the studio. And then uh, I lost track of John, and John went back and joined Marcy and the Imperials, which were now the Village Collies. So uh, uh, John called me one day and says, hey, Joe, they're looking for a bass player. And I know you know a lot of the songs. You know, you want to come down and audition? I said, sure. So I went down there, auditioned. I met uh, Ernie. I knew Johnny already. Um, I forgot who the drummer was back then. It wasn't Manuel. Uh, Fuzzy was there, of course, and and uh, we played a few songs, and then I went home, and then they called me a couple hours. I said, okay, Joe, do you want to join the band? I said, sure, fantastic. So I joined the Village Callers about, uh, I think it was 1966, somewhere in there. Now, were they already called the Village Callers when you joined? Uh, no, they were just changing over to the name. Matter of fact, about a week later, we came up with the name the uh, village callers and as i recall it came from it was the name of an album by who was it willie bobo or somebody yeah so it came from an album by uh, willie bobo yeah any great name and uh great name um amazingly you know because all my bands uh, mark and the escorts for the first couple of years then we became the men from sound and we did the circuit for several years and you guys did, but I, we, I don't think we ever played on the same bill. I, I, all my posters I, I've looked at, I don't see it. Oh, so yeah, we was, never did. Yeah, We played a ton of gigs back then. Yeah. Uh, we used to play on Fridays maybe three or four times at all the different halls. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Around there, Roger Young, Big Union, Little Union, The Elks, The Bachelors. Uh, there was quite a few out there. And Kennedy then. Hall eventually. That, that oh, yeah. Up. Yeah, the and Montebello Ballroom. Do you guys play there too? Oh yeah, oh, yeah. we used to carry that Hammond organ up. Well, this, this is an opportune moment to bring this up. 
uh, when I do these shows with the East LA bands of the 60s, any members of the bands from the 60s, I look for uh, flyers that they were on. So I have a bunch of them here I want to just kind of mention. It might spur some memories. Uh And uh, they're kind of, I think they're pretty much in order of date. So Mm -hmm. here's one. It says Soul Burst, Saturday, August 13th, probably, I'm guessing, 64, could be 65. And the other bands were the Emeralds, the Prophets, and then, of course, the Village Callers. Village Callers. There it is. Yes. You know. And of course, a lot of memories. Yeah, you remember the Emeralds? They were a very good band. Prophets oh, yeah. were a pretty good band too. Oh yeah, the Prophets were. Yes, yes, I knew quite a few of the members. Now, check this one out. This is the most amazing flyer ever. <laughs> you won't believe it, but it's uh, Roger Young Ballroom, the Prophets, Village Callers, and Emeralds again. And mm-hmm. uh, anybody that's prudish, look away. <laughs> Yeah. You remember this one? Yes, yes, I remember that one. Yes. The band's names are on the boobs. Yeah. I thought this up, but a uh, pretty cool flyer. It, it, Just, uh, it doesn't even have a date. It doesn't even have a date on it. <laughs> does it? <laughs> okay. Oh, no, it does. It says August 13th. But it doesn't say the year. It rarely would say the year. Yes. This has to be 64 or 65, I'm guessing. What do you think? 65? Yeah, yeah, maybe 66. You think that? It, they... al- yeah, it almost seems like it's a, a group that uh, we used to play for. There were. Uh, uh, it, it says was the a, IJs. Is that it? It says the IJs. Yeah, yes, yes. Uh, it uh, was an Oriental group, um, an Oriental organization, and uh, they would do a lot of fundraisers. Which and... brings up, which brings up a good point. Um, the Roger Young, a lot of Asian rock groups would play there, Asian American rock groups. Right. And uh, my band, Mark and Iskers, played there one time, but I know the Emeralds played there a lot. But I recently found out, I don't know if you know about this, I just recently found out that um, there was a parallel music scene happening in Little Tokyo, right across the bridge, where mm. there were a lot of Asian American bands. And they were very much influenced by the East L.A. bands. And they played Midnighter songs and uh, all that. And just recently, I found out about a book that came out written by one of the guys from one of those bands. And it's a whole book about the history of all those bands in Little Tokyo. And um, they also had occasionally there'd be a Chicano or two from East L.A. in those Asian bands or, say, a black dude. Uh, But it was mainly... Asian groups and the Roger Young was one of their main places. So that's mm-hmm. where the bands kind of came together. There'd be the Emeralds and you guys would go there. And did right. do you remember any Asian bands you played on the bill with? Uh no, I don't. Um I remember playing at the General Lee's restaurant. Uh, you know, back then when it was there, we played for uh, the owner's daughter's wedding. Oh. And that was a big one. Boy, that was mm-hmm. huge. It was cool. huge. Well, anyway, interestingly enough, what happened is the guy I, I wound up getting in touch with the guy who wrote the book mm-hmm. and uh, I wound up going to an event and uh, Anthony Beret, the leader of the Emeralds went with me where they all had a reunion, all those guys from those bands in mm. little Tokyo and, and certain people spoke and had about their memories of the times. Yeah. A famous group came out of that scene. Have you heard of Hiroshima? They became a very yeah. popular oh, yeah. jazzy group. Well, yeah. they, they had their roots in that early scene. So yeah. I didn't know that there was a, a whole parallel scene going on at the same time as ours till like a year ago. Yes. Uh, also, uh, with when uh, when we started the Village Callers with the song Hector, we uh, we we were hooked up with this uh, with this promoter in Japan, uh, Shin Miyata. Oh yeah, yeah. He put and, out a Village Callers album, right? Yeah, we right. put out a Village Callers album. Uh, he had a whole East LA thing going oh, over yeah. there with the low riders and all of that so barrio gold no, records yeah, it was called yeah, it, was, it was it was called barrio gold records barrio gold records yeah. yeah yeah he put a lot of uh east l.a and chicano bands over there yes yeah, i'm right. gonna get so, that book so this will be a little time out it's gonna roll but hold on yes okay. as a matter of fact this is the book that the uh gentleman wrote his name is harry manaka mm. wow and it's called Chronicles of a Sensei Rocker. Yeah, and there was a picture, a picture of my, a picture of my band in here. Really? Wow. And a little paragraph about the Emeralds. 
Yeah, about the arrows. Well, and that's something. Very cool book. Yes. Okay, so here's another one. This one is uh, Christmas Dance, 25th of December. Again, could be, I'm guessing this is more 66, yeah. Yes. Village Crawlers, Royal Checkmates, Righteous Rhythms at the Serbian Hall. Remember that? Serbian Hall, yes. The Serbian Hall was huge. Yes. Oh, yeah, I remember that one. Okay. Yes. Yeah, we played Serbian Hall once or twice. And here's a New Year's Eve dance. Little Union Hall, Village Callers, Royal Checkmates, Royal Checkmates, Righteous Rhythms, and the IBMs. <laughs> it's been around the same time. Yeah, it must have same, been around. Same groups. Yes. Wow. Yeah. And then uh, here's another one. <laughs> January 12th, 1968. Oh. Royal Checkmates, Village Callers, Our Lady of Talpa Auditorium. Oh, yeah. And it says here, Sock it to me, which is what yeah. came out of that Laugh Man <laughs> show. And, you know, Three Dog Night on one of the records, on Try a Little Tenderness, and Sock it to me, Sock it to me. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. There it is. Sock it to me one more time. Yeah, Lady Altalpa. We ended up doing quite a few fundraisers for them to help yeah. out the kids there. Did you do any um, East LA College rock and roll shows? Uh, yes, we did. Uh, we did. We did. We actually did them with uh, Mr. Taggart. Yes. Yeah, so we did the very first one with him, oh. and uh, we ended up winning that. Uh, we won a trophy and a thousand dollars cash. Nice. As yes. the village callers? Oh, yes, I did. as the village callers. And I think we were in the second one, but I think we came in second or third. As I recall, some of them were Battle of the Bands, but many of them were not Battle of the Bands. They were just shows with a bunch of groups. Yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, here's another one. This is a benefit dance featuring the sounds of success, the Royal Checkmates, the Village Callers, April 26, 1968, Huntington Park Ballroom. Oh, yes. We played there too. Oh, yeah, Huntington Park Ballroom. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it brings back a lot of memories going out there. Yeah, I think we played there once, Mark and the Escorts. Now, here's. Um, Big dance and show featuring the village colors. That's when people started using T H E E because That's the Midnighters started that. Yes. And it says after their live album recording at the Plush Bunny and their latest release, Hector. Also on the bill were the Counts, the Counts, and the Royal Checkmates. May 31st, 1968, 9 to 2 a.m. And these are wow. teenage dances. 2 a.m. Yeah. Donation two dollars and fifty cents, eighteen and over. Well, eighteen and over, not twenty-one. Eighteen and over. Wow. Yeah, look at that. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. Okay. Okay, and then here's one. Valentine dance, February 9th, nineteen sixty-eight, eight to midnight, featuring the village callers and the soul music of the fabulous sounds, starring Johnny and. Lavarez, CYO Hall. Yeah, CYO Hall. Wow. The fabulous sounds. I remember them vaguely. Yes. Uh, me too. We did some shows with them. Yeah. And then here's Salesian High School, which is Mr. Taggart. Yeah, Mr. Taggart. Um, Night of Soul, The Young Hearts, The Village Callers, The Royal Checkmates, May 17th, 1969. Roger Young. Yes, Roger Young. Yeah, the Roger Young was a rough event for us because we we had to go up the stairs with the uh, Hammond organ, the oh. little and everything. Uh, the Montebello Ballroom was up the stairs too. Oh, uh, Montebello Ballroom was another rough one. Yeah. <laughs> okay, now here's the uh, a fundraising dance: the Royal Checkmates Village Callers organized set and the Emeralds again, April eleventh, nineteen sixty nine. Wow. Uh, yes memories memories a lot of good memories so that's what i have so speaking of the plush bunny this is very important you guys got a residency there and i never made it there i guess because i was always <laughs> yeah. playing you never got there but how long did you play at the plush bunny oh uh, we first started playing there sunday afternoons 
okay, because the owner wanted to have a band Sunday afternoon to have happy hour and all that. So we said, okay, so we played from, uh, I think it was four to eight, and then the house band played from nine to 145 back then. So later, as we went along, people started liking the band, so they start, So we started getting bigger crowds, and he says, how would you like to play six nights a week? Well, we said, great. So we started playing six nights a week down there. We did that for, for quite a few weeks. We would do maybe six weeks at a time and then, and then take a two or three week break, do casuals and then go back there. Or else we go to the haunted house uh, over there in Hollywood Boulevard. That was a jumping place. Now the plush bunny, wasn't it a nightclub for 21 and over? Oh yes. yes. Now were you guys all 21 or over? Uh, not back then. <laughs> no, no, I was, let's see, I, Ernie Hernandez and I were 21, but then Fuzzy, Emmanuel, the drummer, and John Gonzalez, and the singer Angie were uh, 20 years old. Manny Fernandez was a drummer, right? Yes, yeah, Manny Fernandez. Great drummer. Oh, yeah, great drummer. I'm uh, really sorry to say I just, uh, uh, I just saw him at the hospital yesterday. He's in the ICU and prison. Mm -hmm critical condition so mm -hmm. so we, we all we're all saying i mean our prayers to what it helped yes yeah, sad. sorry to hear that um before we get to the haunted house and sunset strip um uh, staying with the plush bunny mm -hmm. so let's talk about the the female singers that you had in order okay first we had ursi our video okay ursi was great she was with us for about uh maybe about a year and a half. And uh, she really developed her voice with the band. Yeah, I, I, the Village Callers, a lot of people don't know this. We used to rehearse five days a week, five to six hours. And we worked on rhythm, vocals, showmanship. We worked on everything. And uh, Ursi was there with us. So she got a lot of vocal exercises, you know, working with, with Johnny and Fuzzy and some of the other guys. So. Uh, so we had Ursi for quite a while, and then uh, Ursi left the band for uh, El Chicano. El Chicano uh, offered her something, and uh, I, she went with uh, Fred and the guys, and uh, she did very well with them, very, very well yes. with them. Uh, after Ursi, we had um, we had El Anaya for about... I think for about six months and then he went over to the midnighters okay. i just want to say i had mentioned named the the female singer so oh. ellen i was not female oh no no I was, <laughs> that's right and he was ellen i uh used to be the lead singer for the impalas right not right. the eye palace the impalas the impalas yeah. and i remember him from that and i i didn't know till you told me yesterday that he sang with you guys for a while yeah and yeah. then he later sang with the midnighters after yes. he left I, you know, um, another guy that, that we interviewed, you know, before singers, this little skinny, scrawny guy came and uh, he auditioned for us. And uh, he sang pretty good, but then we thought, gee, you know, not a, didn't look too good on stage. Well, later we found out it was Edward Almost. Oh, wow. <laughs> I didn't know. So I think we would have hired him. We probably would have been in better shape. But, you know, and then, uh, and then from there we went on to uh, Angie Bell. Uh, Angie Bell was working with her group, her sisters and uh, brothers, and uh, she decided to join the Village Callers, and uh, she was with us for a majority of the time. And then uh, later, we we ended up uh, getting Jerry Jerry Logan, Jerry Gonzalez, and uh, she was there. Yeah, uh, they all were great singers. I mean, yes. great singers, uh, Jerry, all great singers. Ursi went on. Ursi had been in the Sisters before that. Very popular right. group in East LA, and yes. then uh, she went on to play with a lot of people, and wound up in the 2000s doing an album with Ry Cooter. Oh, wow. and also participating on the Chavez Ravine album. So let's talk about the Latin percussion. How you guys started using Latin percussion? Oh, okay. Back back when I first joined the Village Callers, uh, uh, the members of the band had their own styles of playing. Ernie Hernandez loved. Um, uh, Oh, I gotta forget a uh, jazz player of uh, uh, West Montgomery. Oh, yeah, yeah. So he loved West Montgomery. So we did a lot of West Montgomery. Uh, Johnny Gonzalez loved Jimmy Smith and some of the other organists back then. So we did a lot of that. And Fuzzy 
just love the regular sax players. So, so we did like, you know, listen here and some of the tunes that were out back then. And uh, it wasn't until later, Johnny, Johnny started going to LACC and uh, met up with uh, Chuck Mastin. And uh, Chuck Mastin was a conga player. Uh, he was from the East Coast, uh, was here in LA uh, working as a chemical engineer. So, but, but Chuck had a love for music. So uh, he came down and heard us at a gig one time and he really liked the band. So we invited him to come down and sit in. So he brought his congas and cowbells and timbales and everything that he had. And, and man, we just really loved the sound. And, and then uh, we, we invited him to join the group. Well, when he joined the group, he said, you know, why don't we develop a Latin style with all the music you guys are doing? We said, sure, fantastic. So we would sit down for hours and listen to all these different people, Tito Puente, Mongo Santa Maria, Willie Bobo. I mean, a ton of Latin, Latin guys. And uh, we picked up a lot from that. We, we just picked up a lot from that. And uh, back in the old days, we were the first to record Evil Ways. Uh, it was an old Willie Bobo tune. And, uh, and, and we actually recorded it. Uh, went out to San Francisco, was playing down there. It was becoming a hit. Uh, Santana and Columbia Records heard it. They put out their version. And that was the end of ours. <laughs> and made their career. That, that was yeah, the end. Made, right, right. Yeah. Made their career. Yeah, because that was really the first step of, you know, Latin music that, uh, that was really out. Yeah. So, but, uh, but, you know, Chuck brought a lot into the band and, uh, you know, we owe him so much for actually developing the Latin sound in East LA. And we were the first band to do that. I think so. Yes. Uh, so talk about how you guys met Eddie Davis and the recording thing started happening. Uh, Eddie Davis, uh, Eddie Davis had heard the band at, at a gig we did, probably one of the Roger Young gigs, because he, he was always scouting around for different groups. And he heard the band and came to one of our rehearsals and talked and said, hey, I'm a promoter. I can help you. Do you have anything original? And we said, no, but, but you know, we need to work on something. Well, he came about a week later, and uh, John Gonzalez and I were, were, were going through some riffs. And, uh, you know, John was messing with the organ. I was messing with the bass. And then Eddie came and he says, you know, I really like that, that rhythm and that sound you guys are doing. I want you to work on that. Okay, try to develop something. And that was Hector. So, so you know, John and I put together the arrangement, brought in the rest of the band, aligned the whole rhythm section, the horns, Fuzzy put the vocals in, you know, Hector, I mean, probably the first rap tune in East L.A. <laughs> you know. For those who don't know, Eddie Davis was a uh, promoter kind of guy, producer, but he also owned several small independent record labels, Pharaoh, Rampart, you know, uh, Linda. And uh, he's the one that recorded uh, Cannibal and the Headhunters hit Land of a Thousand Dances on his label. Uh, the Blendells hit La 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 La. The Premier's big hit, national hit, Farmer John. So he had these labels and he was recording all these East L.A. groups. Uh, um, and his partner was Billy Cardenas, who would sometimes find the bands and groom the bands and uh, so that Eddie Davis was very influential in recording so many of these LA bands and so he came along with, with you guys a little later after all those hits this this must have been what late 60s yeah late 60s yes yeah. in the late 60s yeah but Eddie was a great guy uh had a great vision I mean uh you know he said I want you guys to come into the studio and I want you to record Hector well you know back then we didn't do overdubbing he had me do the bass part on six tracks and, and overlay those six tracks. And he says, I want that bass fat. <laughs> and, and he says, I also want the drums fat. So I think Manuel did it a couple times also. And uh, that's, that's what really made the song, the drums and the bass. And, and the bass was the most sampled bass part that actually came out of East LA. And a lot of groups sampled it. So. Another thing we should explain is the song was called Hector because Hector was the name of your manager. Yes. Yes, it was. <laughs> was it Hector Rivera, is it? Yeah, yeah, Hector Rivera. And yeah. so you guys named the song. It was an instrumental after him. Yeah. And uh, it was so long 
that they they turned it into Hector Part One and Part Two. And one was on <laughs> side A, one was on side B of the forty-five, right. right? Right. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. And what about the idea that uh, I think it was Fuzzy started saying all these <laughs> jokes about Hector at the end? <laughs> yeah. Right. Hector, yes. you're so ugly. <laughs> Tienes cara de lastima. You have a, <laughs> a face of shame, or you know, yeah. Yeah, yeah we we used to make a lot of fun of uh, Hector's dad because because you know Hector's dad lived at the house where where, where we used to rehearse, and 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 his dad had his bedroom right right next to the big dining area. So so we were there, and then uh, we we used to smoke back then. And his dad used to yell, Hector, Hector, I can't breathe. The boys are smoking. And we would be laughing and blowing smoke underneath the door. Oh, we were horrible. And, <laughs> yeah, young people do. Oh, yeah, we were horrible kids. So, so you know, that was that was really part of the song, too. You know, Fuzzy said, Hector, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. So I was really. That's on the record, too? Yes. Yeah. So it was funny. It was happy. Oh, was it, it was, recorded live or that was not recorded live? Uh, that was not recorded live. We actually went into the studio on that one. Yeah. Did you guys make a lot of noise like a lot of these our East LA records where people would be yelling in the background and stuff? Yeah, uh, uh, we didn't have a lot of people there, but then you know we just had we just had the girlfriends and the guys in the band, and we made a lot of noise. And Eddie recorded all that. That's what so. we did too. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, yeah, so that record did very well. Yes, it did very well. It was sampled by many rap groups with Cypress Hill and the Beastie Boys sampled it. Yeah, Beastie Boys, yes. Uh, uh, Cypress Hill actually used it for a long time, and, and we finally finally got a little bit of the publishing on that. So so that's why we get you know quite a bit of the royalties nice. every, every quarter on that. Uh, yeah. And then recently wound up in a Quentin Tarantino movie. Yes, the Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Which is behind yeah. you, the, the, the poster. Yeah. yeah, it's right right up above me. But let me show you the the album that I have here. And uh, our our song Hector is in there. It's 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 a short version. It was a lot longer, but they had to cut the movie back some. So uh, they end up cutting our song and a few others. But, but you know, we still have some airplay in there. And, uh, you know, Quentin, Tar Quentin Tarantino... He uh, lived in Monterey Park, you know, back in the '60s, and uh, his dad bought him a reel-to-reel -reel tape, and he would record a lot of the songs in the '60s. So when when uh, he came up with this movie based in the '60s, uh, he got over ten thousand songs from all over the world that wanted to be in that movie, and and he said no. He says I have the songs that I want, and I'm going to contact these groups. So, so sure enough, you know, he did contact us and we said yes right away, mm -hmm. you know, but, it, but, you know, we ended up getting paid, of course, and all that. And uh, he was upfront with everything. So everything turned out very nice. And then uh, he also, he also put together a compilation of all the hits of all his movies. So, he, so he only selected so many and uh, Hector's in that compilation. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I didn't oh, yeah. know that he had lived yeah. in Monterey Park, which was just north of the East L.A. area. Right. A yeah. little step up the social ladder, but it was right, right there next to <laughs> Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, well, that's cool. So you guys also made a live album with Eddie Davis, right? Live at the Plush Bunny? Yes, yes, Live at the Plush Bunny. You want to show that album? You have it? Yes, I have this one right, right here. And uh, it, it's a little dark. It shows Angie Bell. And Ernie and a few of the guys back there, but but then in the back, I have I have the photo of of, of the whole band mm -hmm. and the uh, song titles and all that back there. So there's Angie Bell and Chuck, Ernie, and myself, Johnny, Buzzy, yeah. and Manny. Yeah. And, and that's the album that was re-released in Japan by Shin Miyata, right? Later. Right. Yes, yes, by Shin Miyata. Yeah, yeah, it uh, it actually did real well down there. Uh, uh, we never put a tour to go out that way. And uh, sometimes I'm thinking, I wonder if I should put the old group back together and try to do something. Because, but we still get airplay all over the world. Uh, when I get the royalty statements, I see Japan, South America, England, Germany, all that. I mean, it's uh, 
it's incredible after what 55 60 yeah, years absolutely still out there did um, the record do pretty well when it first came out just in uh, southern california uh yes it did yes it did uh matter of fact we were the first non-black group to be on kgfj Ooh, it's pretty cool okay. uh, and the kgfj thought we were black because of the sound okay so so we went all all the way up to number three and then uh, we were selected to be at the first watts uh, festival so so the song hector was the uh, theme song and then the village callers performed there so were the people shocked that you weren't black well, you know what? It was really interesting because you know, we were in back of this big chain link fence and uh, there was a group playing before us, you know, Patty Drew, you know, working on a groovy thing. Yeah. Fab, I mean, she was a knockout. The band was great and people were cheering. And then when we were in the back and then the uh, the uh, Brown Berets were back there and so were the Black Panthers back then. Mm. And so the brown berets wanted us to wear the brown beret hats. I go, oh, we can't do that. No, no. So, so then you know, Patty Drew was done with her show, and then the promoter says, "Okay, now you guys are up." So we open the gate, we march out. The whole place started booing us. Really? They started booing us. Woo, woo, and they woo. Yes, and then the promoter says, "Hurry up and start. Start with Hector." So we heard up, got got tuned up, played. And then, and then we heard the big roar of the people. Once they heard the song, you were cool. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Once they heard the song, everything was cool. And then we did a lot of Aretha Franklin back then, you know, with Angie. She was great at doing that stuff. And a lot of James Brown. So well, she know, was African-American, wasn't she? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, she was Creole. Actually, Creole. Yeah. And uh, she had a great voice. I mean, I mean, her other sister had a fabulous voice, too. So, but, you know, Angie could really belt out that soul stuff. Yeah. That's always a remedy when a band is great, it overcomes that stuff. I think it happened to El Chicano when they played the Apollo Theater mm. in Harlem. Everybody yeah. thought they were black because Viva Tirado was just yeah, the was curtains so open and there's a gasp. And then when they hear the song, then you win and win them over. That's right. That's right. Uh, Little, Little Ray and the Premiers had that problem. They played at the uh, Santa Monica Civic with all these white groups, you know, and yes. they were they. People were, you know, saying, oh, you beaners and yelling at them. That's right. They yeah. started playing. Everybody <laughs> shut up, you know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Power yeah. of good music. Yeah. Overcomes Hispanic racism groups. temporarily. Oh, God. Hispanic groups never got a lot of credit out there until we started really getting out there and promoting. Uh, thanks to Eddie Davis. You know, he pushed a lot of these groups out there. Absolutely. I mean, you know, Cannibal with the Beatles and with all these big groups that, that you know, they were with. You know, that was that was fabulous. Blendells and Premieres did some big tours. Yeah. Some big major oh, yeah. artists. Uh, Got Dick uh, Clark. Amazing. Oh, we were that. very lucky, the East L.A. bands, because we were so close to Hollywood, you know, just yeah. up the freeway. And so yes. many of us got to record, thanks to Eddie Davis and his uh, small labels, thanks to Bob Keane, even though he was very questionable business-wise. But Bob Keane's labels, you know, recorded The Sisters and Ronnie and the Casuals and Little Ray and a lot of East LA groups were recording for Bob Keane. So there were there were record labels that we could record on. My group recorded for GMP Crescendo Records. Uh -huh. So uh, and we were lucky that we lived close to the record industry. Yes. And that there were yeah. some small labels that were willing to record us. And many of the groups wound up with national hits. Yes. Yes, they did. Yeah, that was great. So then, um, Chico, how did that evolve? Well, um, I left the Village Callers right around 69. Manuel and I and Angie left. And uh, I was I was home and I uh, had a call from Little Ray. And he says, uh, Joe, you know, I'm looking for a bass player to go on the road. And I thought about it. And uh, 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 back then I had a, a, a fiance. And, and I told her, I says, you know, I got an opportunity to go on the road and play. She goes, well, if you go on the road and, and play, well, then you're not going to get married, right? <laughs> and I say, yes, I will. So, so I told her, I says, okay, I'm going to go ahead and do this. I'm going to, I'm going to go back to school. I'll, I'll just go back to college because I was going to college all along, but then we stopped for a while. And, um, and plus I'll just play on the weekends. And she agreed to that. And, uh, and about a week later, Sal Chico called me and his bass player was leaving. 
and he was looking for a bass player. And like I told him, I said, Sal, you know, I don't know how to play salsa and cumbias and chachas, boleros, and, you know, a lot of that stuff he was doing, and mambos. And as I can do all the other stuff, he says, oh, well, I'll show you. And just come down. And I said, okay. So I went down, audition, and he says, okay, I'm, I'm going to go and put you in the band. He says, but just, just work with the piano player, you know, Eddie Travis on some of the rhythms, listen to records. So, you know, that's what I did. And uh, it really took me a while. And, and uh, you know, back then he was doing a lot of beautiful ballads, um, a lot of different types of swings, uh, two beat, four beat things. And I learned a lot from him, uh, learned a lot from Sal. And uh, when uh, Sal left the band, I was able to take over the band. And uh, most of the guys didn't want to do it after Sal left. So I brought in um, uh, Gilbert Avila. I brought in uh, Danny Diaz, you know, some of the local guys. And uh, so... Fuzzy, so, did you bring Fuzzy in too, right? Uh, yeah, Fuzzy came in a little later. I had uh, I had two outstanding uh, sax players, Jim Urkel, mm -hmm. who was now back in New York playing with all these big symphonies and stuff. And uh, Terry Federoff, I don't know if you knew Terry, mm -hmm. great, great sax player. And uh, he went on and did a lot of jazz stuff. So, you know, they were there. And then I had Gilbert. So I had three horns, guitar, bass, drums, and then a singer. I had a singer by the name of Isela Satello. Oh, I know her. Yeah. Yeah. Fabulous vocalist. Yes. She was in movies, did a lot of stuff. I mean, Pretty girl, too. Oh, yeah. Very, very pretty. And uh, she ended up leaving the band. She married the trumpet player that played with uh, Johnny Carson. Mm. So they left the band for bigger and better things, which was you know, fine. And then I got Jerry Gonzalez in the band. She was with Chico for many, many years. But, you know, throughout the years, um, you know, I did what, what, what uh, Sal Chico always, always taught me back then. He says, if you're going to play a cumbia, make it sound like a cumbia. If you're going to play a salsa or a merengue or a bolero, it better sound like one. And sure enough, you know, I, I told all the guys, we got to listen to this and we got to play it the way that it has to be played. And uh, the, that's that's what we do in Chico. We do a lot of rehearsals, you know, just going over that stuff. Every time I bring in a new musician, which is very rare, you know, and we, we go back and relearn everything over again. So he gets acclimated to the sound and, and the different beats and all the songs. So do it right. Yeah, do it right. It was a great experience. I hear a lot of bands play cumbias, and uh, they sound like rock. <laughs> <laughs> rock cumbia, I call it. That's it yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so Jerry Gonzalez is one of the great female vocalists to come out of oh. East L.A. and one of the great Chicano vocalists, period. And uh, yeah, Danny yeah. Diaz, great guitar player. He played with you for, what, like 20 years? Yeah, yeah, 20 years. You know, Danny was with me. Great jazz player. Uh, he's just a hard rocker. He loves hard rock and he can play the heck out of that stuff and jazz. I, and I did a show with him too. One of the East LA music stories, very interesting. Check it out. Oh yeah. Yeah. He's just very, very good. You know, Danny. And, uh, you know, I had a lot of, a lot of really, really good, you know, musicians come through. Uh, Hurt Martinez played with us a few times. And, yes. uh, man, and, and, you know, he didn't have to rehearse. The guy just picked up everything. I mean, he used to work with Sal Chico years ago, also back in you know back in the old days. Uh, yeah, Hearth Martinez is a genius songwriter and a great guitar player, jazz guitar player, and uh, he did two albums for Warner Brothers, you know, and uh, phenomenal. He, he passed away a few years ago. I, I got to know yeah. him very well. Uh, yeah. Fantastic musician. Yes, he was. Yes, he was. Yeah. Um, also, uh, later on, you got Bertha Oropesa as a lead vocalist. Yeah, Bertha, uh, uh, Jerry left the band. Uh, she got an opportunity to do some recording, so she branched off with another group. And so uh, we were able to get Bertha. Bertha, I mean, Bertha is fabulous. She's still fabulous. She still sings great. I mean, after, after about 23, 24 years with us, she's still doesn't miss a note, has perfect pitch, has a perfect ear. If I hit a note a little flat, she looks at me. Or <laughs> <laughs> Evil just, eye. Uh, even when I mean, she just picks up everything. She, and plus, she's a great person. Yes. I mean, strong, voice. A, strong voice. Strong voice. Strong voice. Fabulous young lady. 
very, very bright. She's a nurse practitioner. She probably could have been a doctor, but you know, she just chose to you know, stay at that level. You've had quite a roster of great female vocalists. Oh, yes. I've, I've been very, very fortunate to have, have some of the best here, you know, from East L.A. And uh, there was a lot of great vocalists here in East L.A. And then, uh, you know, I use different subs. Uh, Betsy Villasenor. Uh, Betsy's a fabulous singer also. She works with Bruce Soto and a lot of different other groups. But she, but she subs for us. You know, Veronica that works with Suave subs with us once in a while whenever we need her. And then there's another young lady who lives up in Hollywood. She just came in from Texas, um, uh, Sabrina, and uh, she does a great job too. So I'm so, um, very, very fortunate to find some very nice singers, very pleasant, no bad habits. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just great. Yeah. So let's get back to the, uh, the Hollywood thing. So you mm -hmm. were saying with the Village College, you played at the Haunted House, Played at a place called the Cave. Uh, it it was the uh, haunted house, but but inside the stage was called the Cave. Oh, got it. Yeah, the Cave. Yeah, it it was a real interesting back then because we did we did six nights a week, and they would have us for eight weeks straight. And then on our off day, which was Monday, we would be there at the PJs, which is uh, on uh, Santa Monica Boulevard. So uh, we were the the kind of like the show group so so we only did two sets and then the regular band did three sets so we did that seven nights a week for about eight weeks and then we'd be off for a few weeks and then go back pj's in hollywood is where trini lopez made his famous live album we recorded uh and if i had a hammer and all those big right hits. in the early 60s pj's was a big big venue. oh big big place you know the standals were there for a long time yeah yeah they did recording but you know you know they treated us very well you know, we had our own dressing rooms and I mean, everything was, was just a, a real class place. So when was this, Rev? This was around what, 1969, 70? 19, uh, around 1969, close to 70, probably 68, 69. So when you played the Haunted House, was that after uh, Redbone had played there? Well, not Pat, not Redbone, Pat and Lolly Vegas, who later became Redbone. Yeah, they played uh, the Haunted House too. Yes. Yeah, uh, that was probably after them. Yeah. yeah. They, Later, you know, once they recorded "Come Get Your Love," uh, you know they were national, so yeah. you know they had no time for six nights a week. No, but they started there at the haunted house and were very yeah. popular on the strip. Well, you know, they were also at Flush Money for a long time. Really? Yeah, yeah. You know, Pat and Lolly Vegas. I would go by there and I would look at the sign. It had Pat and Lolly Vegas. I go, "Who's Pat and Lolly Vegas?" I never knew until later. And, yeah. And the real last name is Vasquez. Yeah, Vasquez. Yeah. Yes, so they played there at the Plush Bunny before you guys did? Yes, yeah, the Plush Bunny. Uh, matter of fact, about a year ago, you know, we did a show and and uh, we uh, had a backup, Pat Vasquez. He was an outstanding bass player back then. Yeah. I mean, the guy really had the rooms. Man. Good singer, good songwriter. He wrote uh, Witch Queen of New Orleans, which is a major hit. Yes. Yeah. yeah, Pat's a good guy. We played there six nights, and uh, we would do one set from nine to ten, take an hour break. And they would chase everybody out and bring a whole new group back in because the, the people were lined up around the corner. And then we would do another set, take another hour break. We we, we would have to change clothes. That's how hot that place was. So you know, we we, we would be changing like two or three times a night. You talking about the haunted house? Yes. Yeah, the haunted house. It was jam packed. They used to pack it until you couldn't really move in there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Pat told me that a lot of major celebrities would go in there. You know. Yes, yes. Matter of fact, uh, like our guitar player uh, uh, Ernie told me one night. He says, "Hey, Joe, I went down there and had a drink with this young lady." I said, "Really? Yeah, she's uh, Nat King Cole's daughter. Uh, her name is Natalie." I go, "Oh, really?" He goes, "Yeah, really, really nice girl." I go. And was, so she was young. And uh, this, uh, Stevie Wonder came in one time, played drums with us. And was wow. Yeah, yeah, he was there. Uh, uh, a ton of musicians. I mean, a lot of different guys used to come in and listen to the band you know, from uh, in all the different groups up in Hollywood. And But what I used to love about that, uh, we used to finish up at 1.45, 2 in the morning, maybe hang around and have a beer. 
and I walk out of the club at three in the morning, walk out with my bass. I'd be walking down the street, people would greet you, say hello, no problems, no nothing. Back then, it was just so friendly and so great back then. Mm-hmm. Now, now if I was playing there, I wouldn't walk out with my bass. Unless no. you're armed. Yep, yeah, it's, 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 you know, it's not a good scene down there. Tell me about Bill Keys. Okay, uh, Bill Keys um, joined Chico about uh, maybe 16, 17 years ago. Uh, we needed a keyboard player and uh, we needed a sub. So so I called him and I didn't think he was going to do it because he was always working with big groups. He said, sure, I'll do it. So I said, okay. So he came down and uh, he was he was more of a jazzer, a very, very talented guy. I mean, he picked up everything just so quick. So uh, ap- after a few gigs, he just, just, you know, stayed with the band and uh, he was with us for all that time. But uh, uh, he did a lot of recording, had his own recording studio, uh, played with a lot of different groups, uh, played with um, uh, God, the young lady that just passed away. Um, gee, I don't remember her name. Well, I see and, here that he also played with the Pointer Sisters, Shaka Khan. And Edgar Winter, that's not a bad... Uh-huh. She was married to that big producer, the one who shot that girl, and he was in prison. Bill Spector? Oh, you're talking yeah. about Ronnie Spector? Yeah, Ronnie Spector. Yeah, yeah. but he was doing shows with her. And she would come in from the East Coast, and uh, she would do shows and hire Bill, and then uh, have Bill do some of the arrangements, write out the music. And, uh, and I have... I think she would only bring a drummer and bass player with her, so, so Bill would bring everybody else in. So she, he, he was doing a lot of that. And like I say, in a, in a lot of recordings, and, and after a while, he would just record his piano parts and download them into another uh, studio, and then the, they would just take it from there. And you know, now it's a lot of, lot of piecemeal you know, recording. It's not like oh, yeah. the old, you know, where, where you sit in there and do the rhythm section. <laughs> yeah. you know? Do the basic track all together. Yeah, now it's totally different. So, yeah. But uh, Bill... Like, like I said, Bill was with the band for uh, 17 years, did all the arrangement. He was a musical director. And uh, he finally decided, you know what, Joe, I can't afford to be here in California anymore. So him and his wife sold their house and uh, he moved to Arizona and bought himself a real nice house and uh, has his own studio in there now. And, uh, and uh, he's working with a lot of different groups down there. Wow. Uh, so doing very, very well. So just to clarify, as far as the guys from the Village Callers who wound up in Chico, you have Fuzzy, you have Manny Fernandez. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, had, I had Johnny. And Gonzalez? Also work with, yes, and Johnny Gonzalez and Ernie Hernandez. Now, Johnny uh, Gonzalez, didn't he later use uh, Johnny Livingston as a name? Or yeah, something? yes, you know, Johnny Livingston. And yeah, he's still Johnny Livingston. Mm-hmm. And uh, he's doing his own thing with, you know, different tracks that he does, music, easy listening music. So he's and, done well. Oh, yeah. yeah. He's done very well for himself. Yeah, but he just had a show at a country club and he had about about 50 guests. And, and you know, we went and it was very nice. He did. He did a two hour concert, which was very nice. So but he's doing very well. Uh, Ernie Hernandez was in Chico for a while. Also, when he got off the road with uh, Orange Color Sky. And uh, he says, hey, Joe, I need a gig for a while. I says, okay, come down, because you know, I don't have a guitar player. I was only using keyboard and bass. So, so he came in, and, and I think he was with me for about a year, year and a half. And, and then he developed his own thing, his own single and duel. So he branched out, and he's still doing a lot of that. Now, didn't um, Anthony Beret of the Emeralds play a little while for you guys on keyboard? Yes, yeah, Anthony, yes, yes, Anthony. I, I was looking for keyboard one time, and... Uh, and uh, Manuel, the old drummer, told me, he says, hey, I know Anthony. I go, really, from the Emeralds? He goes, yeah. He says, that he's willing to come down and play. So so he came down and played with us for about a year, year and a half. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Anthony was a great guy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So uh, any other thing that we missed that you'd like to talk about? I mean, we kind of covered the whole, the basic story, but I'm sure there's tons of stories in there. But is there anything you'd like to bring up? Well, with the... Uh, with uh, Chico, uh, I've been leader of Chico for 53 years now. And during all that time, we recorded six CDs. We did the soundtrack for a movie, you know, 
uh, Luminarios back in the 80s. Uh, we did a lot of political concerts back in the, I think it was the, most of the 80s, we played for all the politicians. I mean, everybody was calling us to play for them. So we did a lot of fundraisers back then. You know, it was quite an experience meeting all these people. And, and now we do a lot of park concerts and a lot of different shows, parties, weddings, and you know, things of that nature still. So. Play a lot of Stephen's Steakhouse events. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> well, you know, I haven't been at Stephen's this year yet, but in December I have two events then. Oh, nice. Yeah, so in the, which I think is going to be great. Yeah. Uh, so uh, overall, since this is East LA Music Stories, uh, how would you describe your experience just uh, growing up in East LA and being part of that great East LA music scene of the '60s and the '70s? Uh, tell me what how you feel about it. Well, I feel very fortunate that I was in the music scene and met all of the musicians that I met and the groups that I got involved with. I mean, it, it was it, it was really an eye-opening for me. Um, when I was growing up, I grew up in a very poor family. And, uh, you know, we didn't have much. And But playing and just being out there around people, getting invited to different uh, parties and things of that nature after hours, I, I got to see how other people lived and how other people did things. And it really opened up my eyes. And 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 now I brought that down to my kids. I tell them, you know, you got to go to college. And I went to college. I got a degree, work with LA County. I got a fabulous retirement. All my benefits are paid for. I don't worry about anything. <laughs> I don't even play, I tell them. But I play because I love it. It's my hobby. And I enjoy making people happy. That's really my goal now. Yeah. And that should be all our goal for all the yeah, all, yeah, absolutely all musicians. You know, just getting out there. You know, the money is not important. It's just just having the fun and just enjoying it. That's what life's all about, right? If you can't have fun being alive, I mean, if that's you can't right. learn to have that. What do you got? But it was a special time and place. I tell a lot of people because you know we just were born into it. We were there at the right place at the right time, oh. where all these bands were happening. Right, you know, all these there were so many bands, so many teenage venues. And uh, so many promoters, so many record labels. It was all there. It just happened, you know. Yeah, it just happened. It was uh, incredible how many musicians came out of that, how many bands, and what it would have seen it was. And a lot of national hits came out of it. Absolutely. Because I always tell people the 60s and 70s were, were the two best years. I mean, so many groups in the 60s. I mean, the early 60s with the doo-wop stuff and everything yeah. that was. And then the 70s of Chicago, was all those groups that came out, a lot of fun, a lot of parties. You could go somewhere and not worry about anything. Maybe maybe you get in a shoving match with somebody and then you shake hands and everything's fine. Yeah, there were gangs at the time, but there weren't drive-by shootings. And that no, but, but no, they all knew their place. You know, they all stayed in their in their boundaries and, you know, didn't really bother people. Unless it was another gang member, of course, but, you know, they never bothered people. Like, like the way it is now. But, you know, I, um, I, I always worry about my kids going out to parties and clubs and things of that nature. And, uh, you know, I tell them, be careful, be very, very careful out there. Yeah. Stay away from the hard drugs and the alcohol. Yeah. And do it. Yeah. So, Joe, thanks a lot for doing the show, man. It was great talking to you. Oh, thank you very much, Mark. Thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate it. And being a part of history is great. Absolutely. It was a great good time and place, man. Uh, so, uh, okay, man. Well, I'll talk to you later. Have a good one, man. All right. Thank you.